have one of the people, one of the families who have been participating in this experiment on the phone from Australia. So I want to ask Susie a question first and then go straight into talking to Micah. Susie, what is the general intention of this experiment? Well, very generally, it's a twofold intention. The first intention is that the children diagnosed with autism be able to integrate into their bio body suits in this time space reality. And for the parent, it is that the parent would experience kind of a de stressing of what it is to parent these children. So we all know that it's one thing to have a child be able to show up and um, present themselves in a new way. But if the person looking at that child is stressed, then they may not see what's right in front of them. So it is a twofold intention, de-stress, supporting with that for the parents and supporting the integration for the children. Okay, I'm going to go over to Micah now. Micah, you're calling in from Australia, so I, I'm uh, cognizant of the fact that this is a very expensive conversation for you. Thank you for joining us. Can you tell us about your experience on this um, experiment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I was thinking about this last night. There's one thing which has really stood out for me in terms of how my son has been affected and what I'm finding is really that he just seems to be much more willing. And when I say willing, I mean he he's willing to be more present with us. He's willing to use his words. He's, he's willing to interact with us socially. The changes are kind of slight, but this willingness is, is really quite a profound shift for him. How old is your son, Micah? He's nine. Brennan, um, and tell us what the diagnosis is and what his behavior is typically like before. Okay. Well, he's diagnosed with autism. He was able to talk from quite young. He was able to articulate words. And he also seemed to understand what those words meant. But what I found was that he didn't really seem to have a lot of desire to actually use those words. So it, it was something that I was always waiting for, for, you know, years and years. You know, one day it's all going to click, it's all going to fall into place. And I was surprised when it didn't happen. But then things started shifting once the experiment started, particularly in the month of January. We found that when he answered our questions, instead of it being sort of an arduous task for him to do, he would come back to us with quite willingly with his responses and he'd be quite happy and he'd even have an exuberant tone to his voice. It almost as if he was celebrating that he could he could answer our questions and he was talking. So he's more communicative and he's he's speaking a lot more, he's interacting a lot more. I noticed in the email that you sent to Susie, you said that he's laughing, he's pulling different faces, he's inviting you to copy his face. Is that something that's significantly different than prior to the experiment? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There, there are things that emerged which we haven't seen before, like him inviting me to copy his face is, is it's completely new. It's really much more social for him. And the other thing was his interest in drawing now. It, that was just completely absent before the experiment started. So, yeah, it, it's, it's really like it's been great. It's, we've seen a lot of changes happening and we're really enjoying the ride. Does Brennan go to school? Yes. Have his teachers noted any change? I think I think it's actually more the therapists that we see outside of school. The speech therapist. We were taking Brennan to social groups that were run by the speech therapist and 
there was one day when she said to me, I wish I'd been videoing that session because you wouldn't have believed the spontaneous comments that were coming from him. And the occupational therapist also said that she was finding him more interactive, much more engaging with eye contact. So Brennan is actually much more present in his body, which was really part of the original intention if it was his soul's purpose. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Now, I understand that in this experiment, one parent is usually also participating. In your family, is that you? Yep, it's actually both my husband and I. We're both receiving the broadcast. What are you noticing in yourselves? That's a hard one to actually put words to. Sometimes I get this feeling like it's almost as if I'm living in a storybook. I don't know if that makes sense at all. It, it, it's because it's kind of outside of the reality that I've known. So sometimes it's kind of like I'm watching myself doing all the activities in my life, which I did before, but it's as if now it's in a storybook and the colours are colours seem to be more intense when I look around. Does that give you an idea? Sort of, sort of. What about your husband? Has he said anything about how he's noticing changes? Not so much, no. He's, it's more, um, I guess I'm sort of more tuned into what's happening and this was, the experiment was really something that I wanted to do so I'm sort of noticing things a lot. He was just happy to support it, so... So you're generally feeling um, an energetic change in your own space and you're also seeing many, many changes in your son Brennan's behaviour as well. So uh, this question has to be asked. Do you think that these changes would have happened without this experiment? I don't think they would have happened. There would have been so many happening in such a short space of time. I think... Maybe some of them would have happened slowly further down the track, but not, uh, not this many changes in this amount of time. Micah, thank you very much for joining us today, and I'd love to be kept informed of Brennan's progress. I'd love to let you know. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Bill, yes. what do you think is going on here? Well... One of the things is, of course, it's a new physics, a new, different than orthodox science physics. The other thing, another thing that has to be understood is that we are interacting with the unseen universe, that is, highly evolved beings of great intelligence living in what I call the unseen, sort of higher dimensions of reality. They are participating in this experiment and they want it to happen because these children are advanced souls who are forerunners of this epoch that we've started into. And there are difficulties to shifting from one cosmological epoch to another where there's great differences of coherence and structural aspects between these epochs that we all participate in uh, when we're in them. And so it's a difficult time of that transition. So these children are forerunners. They bring, I think, capabilities far beyond the norm, and, but they're having difficulties because the because they are advanced souls. And so getting an advanced soul into the bio-body suit created by females of an earlier epoch from their perspective is difficult because there are structural changes in us as we will evolve from one epoch to another. 
That's my working hypothesis. Do I really know that? Of course not. But I certainly have an intuitive feeling about that. So I am very grateful that this has been so successful because we started this adventure, we imprinted for this adventure on the 3rd of December 2012. And we've had feedback from as early as the next day across the world. So we'll hear something of that, and this with from Micah is uh, another piece from someone in Australia. So it says that the energetics, the key point is it's physics, okay, but it's a kind of physics very much in advance of that related to the physics of our every everyday distance-time world physics. This is what's so groundbreaking about this. I mean, this truly, the implications of this are just phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, this could change the way society not only thinks about these kids, but about us and our abilities and what is possible. Um, Susie, you've got some of your certified practitioners enrolled in this trial, and I understand that even before the official start of the trial, they were reporting some interesting changes to you. Can you tell us? about some of those? Yeah, I think I'm I'm still sitting here with my mouth hanging open just in <laughs> absolute awe of listening to this conversation. Number one, it's like, oh my God, how long has it taken yeah. for this conversation yeah, to actually been had? So it thank you, Sandy, for that. I'm truly appreciative. As far as having the conversation before the intention experiment began Uh, Dr. Tiller and I did bring together the initial people who were interested in the experiment and to give them a little bit of information about it. But what was fascinating to me is within, you know, five minutes of hanging up the phone after having the conversation about just what we wanted to present, what were the possibilities and potentials, I had two of my certified practitioners call me immediately and say just by having the conversation that they were noticing changes in the moment with their children right there at that time. And a lot of those changes that they were noticing in that moment had to do with, again, with greater presence. One woman had said that she was noticing that the whole time she was on the phone talking with us, her child is engaged in kind of purposeful play. He's he's not stimming or those kinds of things, but he was actually engaged in play. He was happy. He was noticing the environment, those kinds of things. Another one of the parents was also indicating a greater presence, an ability for that child to have greater conversations with her, wanting to wanting to engage with her in new ways. So Again, when Dr. Tiller talks about beyond that time-space reality, even as this was an intention in our own hearts, it was already beginning well yep. before it actually began. May I interject here? Sure. Are you through, through for the moment, Susie? I am. Thank you. We noticed in the experiment we be- did before this, the, the experiment between here and Berlin, Okay, it was an eight-month-long experiment to change the pH of water by one and a half pH unit uh, in Berlin. The important thing we found about that, to cut it sort of short, is that it's called retrocausation rather than our normal consideration, which we call causa- causality. And we found in that experiment the retrocausation event occurred at the time we were discussing the experiment, which was a month, one month before I switched on the device. The things started behaving in Berlin ahead of them uh, behaving in our laboratory in Payson, Arizona. And our once, so the German data gathering was occurred before we even switched on the device, but this huge amount of a month, it's, it's incredible. But it, it happened. The, we're tracking the information also in Payson. 
once we started, we were behind, but very within the next month, we had caught up, and the two, the computer which was recording data in Berlin and the computer co recording data in Payson, Arizona, eventually got in parallel with each other and just tracked each other uh, over the over the subsequent eight months. So it's a real phenomenon. I have personally had experiences where I might want to say something to somebody, and I don't. But I think it. I talk. I talk about it with someone else. I, you know, I want to be kind and sensitive to that other person, and I don't have to do anything because I've experienced that whatever I was going to say. You know, they come and they say it to me. They open the conversation. Their behavior changes. We hear so much about the, the work of heart math. We hear about we are all one. We hear about how our thoughts can affect everything around us. Why is it taking the society out there so long to even begin to consider that our intentions can be very helpful with these children? Can I... Can I uh Maybe if I could step in and just try to keep it short. You know, in the last really big epoch change, which was from the theocrats to the beginnings of science in the days of Copernicus and Galileo and Newton, the, a century later, Descartes made the statement uh, as an assumption that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. That was very useful in its day. And he made that statement because there were, was still, a century later, there was a great hangover from the theocratic indoctrination to the beginnings of the science indoctrination. And, and it took another century before, in essence, everybody was, singing the same song about science, and they were willing to let the theocracy aspects go, but it took two centuries. So changing your mindset is very difficult, and in today's world, the priests of the world are the scientists. They have been in power a long time, and very much like the days of Galileo, where the theocrats wouldn't even look through the telescope, his telescope at the data, the same thing is happening today. Orthodox science will not look at the data that I'm talking about. When I send papers for certain aspects to get published, they are declined. The, the Berlin experiment was rejected. When I wrote a paper on the towards the union of science, uh, logos and mythos, which really means uh, science and mysticism, that was rejected likewise. So it is... It seems to be a human thing that you can get stuck in in a certain box of your reality and you have tremendous difficulty and, and courage to shift out of that box. And that's where we are today. The scientists are wonderful, bright, capable people, but they are incredibly stuck in the distance time only science. 